good day. As this year commences, high inflation and weak economic growth continue to shape global conditions. Russia's war in the Ukraine drags on, and recession risks remain elevated in the euro area, even though energy constraints have eased. Growth prospects for the United States this year are lower. The growth outlook for China has improved, but is likely to remain modest by historical standards. In the developing world, a number of economies face debt distress, exacerbated by tighter global financial conditions. Last year, higher than expected headline inflation and rising core inflation led major central banks to accelerate the normalization of policy rates. With advanced economy interest rates likely to increase in the near term, we expect financial asset prices globally to remain volatile. Taking these and other factors into account, the SAP's forecast for global growth in 2023 is revised slightly lower to 1.6%. We expect better growth in 2024 at 2.6%. The International Monetary Fund's October forecast will be updated later this month. While South Africa's GDP was relatively strong, growing 1.6% in the third quarter of 2022, the expansion was not broad-based we forecast no growth in the fourth quarter. For the whole of last year, GDP growth of 2.5% is expected. For 2023, and as a result of extensive load shedding and other logistical constraints, the bank now forecasts GDP growth of only 0.3%. Given the scale of load shedding, the bank estimates that it deducts as much as two percentage points from growth in 2023 compared to the previous estimate of 0.6 percentage points. Over the medium term, the forecast takes into account ongoing high levels of load shedding and more modest household spending and investment growth than previously. Investment is still positive, but is revised down due to weaker confidence and lower growth than we previously expected. With declining commodity prices, exports are also forecast to be less robust. The forecast incorporates an assumption of increased load shedding in each year compared to what was penciled in at the time of the November meeting. As a result of these factors, the economy is forecast to expand by 0.7% in 2024 and by 1% in 2025. While economic growth has been volatile for some time, prospects for growth appear ever more uncertain than normal. A material reduction in load shedding would significantly raise growth. There could also be higher investment in alternative energy sources as firms and households offset the impact of load shedding. Upside risks to global growth could also arise from reduced geopolitical tensions, a stronger recovery in China, and consequential increases in export commodity prices. With a lower rate of potential, our current reduced growth forecast leaves the output gap around zero, implying little positive or negative impact on inflation from expected growth. After the downward revisions to the GDP forecast, the risks to the medium-term domestic growth outlook are assessed to be balanced. As expected for some time, 
Commodity export prices continue to trend gradually lower. While oil prices increased somewhat at the end of last year compared to November, our oil price forecast is slightly lower, averaging 89 US dollars per barrel in 2023. South Africa's export commodity price basket is expected to continue to decrease by about 18% this year and stabilize in 2025. As a result of weaker export outcomes and prospects, the current account balance is estimated to have been negative 0.7% of GDP in 2022 and forecasts to deteriorate to about negative 1.8% for the next three years. Although fiscal risk eased over the past year, weaker commodity prices and rising state-owned enterprise financing needs could reverse that positive outcome. Financing conditions for rent-denominated bonds remain tight. 10-year bond yields currently trade at about 10.3%, despite the expected moderation of inflation over the forecast period. Policy normalization in major economies and slower global growth last year contributed to depreciation of many emerging market currencies, including the rent. In recent months, while better global growth prospects have increased appetite for riskier assets, the rent has been less buoyant than other currencies. The implied starting point for the rent forecast is 16 rents and 92 cents to the US dollar compared with 17 rents 68 cents at the time of the previous meeting. Global economic growth has slowed and prices decreased for some goods and transport services. While headline inflation eased in major economies in December, price pressures continue to spread from goods to services and wages. Our estimate for inflation in the G3 is unchanged at 7.3% in 2022 and slightly lower to 4% in 2023. The forecast for 2024 is lower at 1.8%. Although South Africa's fuel price inflation for last year averaged 34.5%, it is expected to be negative 2.7% in 2023. Local electricity price inflation has been revised higher at 12.9% in 2023, 14.5% in 2024, and 10.9% in 2025. While global food price inflation continues to ease, local food price inflation is revised up again, in part due to the lacked impact of the weaker exchange rate. Food price inflation reached 9.2% in 2022 and is now expected to slow to 7.3% in 2023 and 4.4% in 2024. Headline inflation in 2022 came out at 6.9%. The bank's forecast of headline inflation for 2023 is unchanged at 5.4% and is slightly higher at 4.8% for 2024. In 2025, we still expect headline inflation of 4.5%. Our forecast for core inflation is somewhat lower at 5.2% in 2023 and 4.7% in 2024. Services price inflation in 2023 is forecast to be 5.1%, lower than the 5.5% previously expected. On the back of lower public transport services, housing rental price inflation and owner's equivalent rent. Core goods inflation is also forecast somewhat lower for this year at 5.5%. 
The forecast for core inflation is in 2024 and 2025 is largely unchanged at 4.7% and 4.5% respectively. The forecast for average salary growth is broadly unchanged. Despite a benign unit labor cost outcome in 2022, lower productivity and higher inflation expectations raise the forecast for this year and next. While core inflation in December came out significantly better than expected, increases in electricity and food price inflation and higher headline inflation for 2022 keep the headline inflation forecast elevated in the near and medium term. Risks to the inflation outlook are assessed to the upside. Despite some easing of global producer price and, pro and food inflation, global price levels remain elevated and Russia's war in the Ukraine continues. The oil market is expected to remain tight, particularly as China's economy rebounds. Electricity price inflation has shifted significantly higher this year and next, and other administered prices continue to present clear medium-term risks. Domestic food price inflation continues to surprise higher. Load shedding may have broader price effects on the cost of doing business and the cost of living. Given sticky price and food price inflation, considerable risk still attaches to the forecast for average salaries and hence for the trajectory of core inflation. G3 interest rate levels for the forecast period are similar to those projected in November, averaging 3.7% in 2023, 3.3% in 2024, and 2.4% in 2023. Tightened global financial conditions have raised the risk appetite of economies needing foreign capital. While the rent appreciated in December alongside other emerging market currencies, it has depreciated by about 1.6% against the US dollar since the beginning of the year. Given deteriorated growth prospects, the risk of currency weakness has increased. Inflation expectations increased strongly over the past year. Average expectations of future inflation surveyed in the fourth quarter of 2022 increased to 6.1% for 2023 and 5.6% for 2024. Expectations for inflation in 2023, based on market surveys, sit at 5.5%. Long-term inflation expectations derived from the five-year break-even rates in the bond market have moderated to about 5%. In the second quarter of 2022, headline inflation breached the upper end of the target range and is forecast to remain above it until the second quarter of this year. Headline inflation is only expected to sustainably revert to the midpoint of the target range by the fourth quarter of 2024. The forecast takes into account the policy rate trajectory indicated by the bank's quarterly projection model. As usual, the repo rate projection from the quarterly projection model remains a broad policy guide changing from meeting to meeting in response to new data and risks. Against this background, the MPC decided to increase the repurchase rate by 25 basis points to 7.25% per annum with effect from the 27th of January 2023. Three members of the committee preferred the announced increase. Two members preferred a 50 basis points increase. The revised repurchase uh, rate 
remains supportive of credit demand in the near term, while raising rates to levels more consistent with the current view of inflation and risks to it. The aim of policy is to anchor inflation expectations more firmly around the midpoint of the target bend and to increase confidence of attaining the inflation target sustainably over time. Guiding inflation back towards the midpoint of the target bend can reduce the economic cost of high inflation and enable lower interest rates in the future. Achieving a prudent debt, public debt level, increasing the supply of energy, moderating administered price inflation, and keeping wage growth in line with productivity gains would enhance the effectiveness of monetary policy and its transmission to the broader economy. Economic and financial conditions are expected to remain more volatile for the foreseeable future. In this uncertain environment, monetary policy decisions will continue to be data dependent and sensitive to the balance of risks to the outlook. The MPC will seek to look through temporary price shocks and focus on potential second round effects and the risks of de anchoring inflation expectations. The bank will continue to closely monitor funding markets for stress. This concludes uh, our statement, and at this stage, I would like to invite members of the media to pose uh, questions that you might have, and between myself and members of the committee, uh, we would address your questions. Prinesha. Thank you, Governor. It's Pranesha Naidu from Bloomberg. I have a few questions, please. Um, on the decision to raise the repo rate by 25 basis points, can you please elaborate on that? The tone of the statement uh, suggested a bigger hike was coming. Um, so if you could give us any more detail on that, uh, that would be great. Does today's move um, I mean, we're, we are at or close to the end of the hiking cycle. Um, and how big a positive real rate would give the MPC comfort to start holding? Um, also, if you could please uh, share the MPC's assessment or even quantum for the impact of load shedding and administered and regulated prices, including the upcoming electricity price hikes on inflation. That would be really great. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor. My name is Velem Senim Tiani from the SABC News. Pardon me, mine is just going to be a little bit of a background. There seems to be persistent belief within the ANC ranks that the Reserve Bank must be involved in directly bolstering economic growth and job creation over and above the bank's monetary policy mandate. As you, in, as, as you may know, that during the 55th ANC conference, the issue of nationalizing and uh, the Reserve Bank together with the changing of its mandate featured prominently. And also, the president made some remarks confirming that there would be a possible change. Then my question is, what is that change? Is that change pertaining to the ownership or it's pertaining to the mandate of the Reserve Bank? And also, does that mean that there has, the discussions have begun on the amendment of Section 224 of the Constitution? And lastly, um, do you still view these persistent uh, calls for nationalization of the Reserve Bank and changing of its mandate as the arrival of the Paparians at the gate of the Reserve Bank, just as you said? sometime in 2019. Thank you. I didn't get your name. I know you are from the SABC. My name is Velim Seni. Velim Seni. Yeah, let's say Veli. Veli. Okay, Veli, that's, yes. uh, I prefer to say yeah, people's names in full, but okay, I'll use Veli. Any other questions? Anything online? Uh, nothing. Uh, Veli, I will deal with your question once we have dealt with the MPC. Uh, it will be the last one to be dealt with. 
Prinesha, are you still with us? Um, why 25 basis points? Well, both 25 basis points and 50 basis points were discussed. And the balance of the views tilted towards a 25 percent, 25 basis points uh, increase. And so that is the decision that uh, carries. But you ask the question, the tone of the statement uh, seemed to suggest that a higher hike was uh, coming. Well, I am not sure what tone in the statement, whether it's the written one or is how I said it that it felt like it is uh, a bigger uh, hike is, uh, uh, is coming. But what the statement actually reflects is the fact that inflation globally is at an elevated level. It's reflective of the fact that globally the public is intolerant of higher inflation. And that central banks, tasked with the responsibility of price stability, cannot just talk about restoring price stability, but have got to demonstrate in the actions that are taken that they mean business about price stability. You can rest assured, this central bank means business about price stability because that is the remit that we are tasked with in terms of the constitution of the Republic of South Africa. What positive real rate will the MPC be comfortable with? Our responsibility, our mandate is price stability. We do not target interest rates. Interest rates are just but one tool that we use to deal with inflation, albeit it is the most important and most effective tool that we have to deal with uh, uh, inflation. And say you ask the question, then where do we end? Meaning, what would the terminal rate be? We do not know what the terminal rate would be. What we do know is that inflation is here, inflation is a problem, South Africans have expressed discomfort with the fact that inflation is eating into their incomes. And South Africans should correctly expect that the central bank should do something about inflation before it permanently erodes their incomes. And the stance that the South African Reserve Bank had taken since we started to adjust policy in November 2021 was reflective of the fact that our mandate says we must protect the value of the currency in the interest of balanced and sustainable growth. And looking back, we can say safely that we have maintained the correct balance in the policy posture that we had taken. Impact of load shedding. It's, uh, it's still a difficult call to quantify uh, exactly. But last year in November, we estimated that load shedding would have taken off 0.6% of uh, the growth. In other words, growth ended up being 0.6% less than what it would have otherwise had been. The intensity of load shedding and the length of load shedding has increased since the uh, November meeting. Our estimate at the moment is that load shedding would have shaved off the growth of 2023 2%. So when we have growth of 0.3%, give or take, we think that growth could have easily have been 2.3% during the course of this year, and that load shedding had actually shaved that off. But load shedding is not just impacting growth, which is the conundrum, or the dilemma that South Africa faces, that it also, we believe, has got price effects. Uh, it has price effects in the sense that businesses and households have to try and find alternative energy. That might be positive for investment, but raises the cost of doing business and raises the cost of living for households 
So in the case of cost of business for businesses, and it raises the cost of living for households. That could have inflationary pressures coming as a, from a load shedding. We have told you to have heard stories of farmers who say that they end up having to uh, cull, stop certain activities because of the impact of load shedding, and that could feed uh, into uh, food prices. We have not been able to quantify exactly what the impact of load shedding on prices would be, but we have got some comfort in our estimate of what it would be on economic growth. Any other question? Five. No. <laughs> oh. Governor, we have a question from Sipelele Dluja at Business Report. If the sub focus GDP growth of 0.3% so early in the year, and with ESCOM predicted to implement load shedding for more than 200 days this year, what are the chances that, the, that South Africa could experience an economic recession this year? And then um, another question, Governor, from Ato Jamini at Alliance News. The MPC is still saying inflation risks are assessed to be on the upside, even though CPI is easing. This sounds hawkish. Would you say rate hikes are starting to have the desired effects? Why don't you give rate increases a chance to work themselves out in the financial system to see their effect? A last question, Governor, from Alexandra Wexler at uh, Wall Street Journal. What were the reasons for the revision higher of, of 20, 22 GDP? Thank you, Governor. Those are all the questions for now. Um, Sipela, uh, thank you. 0.3% uh, so early uh, in the year. Well, inflation, uh, um, load shedding came a little bit too early in the year. So if uh, load shedding comes so early in the year and we are still in summer, um, it had an, uh, an impact on, uh, uh, on growth. Is there a risk of a recession? Well, globally, there is a, a, a view that the global economy could slip into recession. And actually, the IMF estimates that uh, more than half of the countries in the world could be uh, in recession during uh, 2023. Too early to call. Recession is not in our baseline uh, at the moment. But as we have stated, there is a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty uh, out there. The load shedding, I think that last year when we did our estimate of 0 0.6, we expected load shedding on average to be like 150 days uh, in the year. We have since revised that to just over 200 days uh, during the course of 2023. And if we expect that to be the case, then um, it would have an impact on growth. So the 2% the, the reduction in the growth expected growth rate for 2023 is reflective of um, uh, 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 that estimate of what we think load shedding uh, would be uh, during uh, the uh, course of the, uh, the year. Risks to the inflation, we say that they are on the upside. Uh, yes, we say they are on the upside because they are. Uh, we do not know what's going to happen to the oil price. We have talked about the impact of load shedding and that it could feed into uh, food price inflation and other costs of uh, doing business. We have seen that inflation expectations uh, have risen from the November meeting. So the price setters in this economy are expecting that inflation uh, will go up. And if they expect that inflation will go up, the central bank has got to correct their views. And the only way to correct their views is to change our policy settings to reflect that we mean business in keeping uh, in keeping inflation. Uh, it has got nothing to do with uh, the knowledge of Avery. Uh, it is just simple, uh, simple economics. Um, and you ask, uh, couldn't we wait? Well, you see what we can't do 
is to wait until we see the whites of inflation eyes before we take our policy stance. If we wait until we see the whites of inflation's eyes, by that time, it might be too late. Inflation which have eroded the income of South Africans, and South Africans would be correct to say to the central bank, we have given you a mandate to protect the value of our currency. What have you done? At which stage? What are we going to say? We tried to wait? No. We have got to make judgment based on the best information at our disposal to live through to our mandate. Alex, uh, what led to higher growth for 2022? Uh, the, the third quarter of last year surprised us on the uh, upside. It was not just us. Many economies expected growth in the third quarter to be um, uh, lower than what it came out to be. And because that growth came out higher than what we had all expected it to be, we recalibrated uh, our forecast. And uh, as we say, in uh, the fourth quarter, we expect growth to be zero. Even if growth is zero in the fourth quarter, we will still come with growth for 2022 that is higher than uh, 2%. So that is, uh, uh, that is the response. Um, there is a hand at the back. It looks like writers. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, the first question is, is just about growth, and maybe this is one for the research department. Um, in order to make a meaningful dent in un South Africa's unemployment, at what level, you know, does of economic growth uh, do we need to hit, um, as opposed to the very meager 0.3 percent that you're now predicting for this year? Um, and then the other question is. Uh, I think many people would interpret a 25 basis point hike coming after 75 and a lot of aggressive hiking last year as not you meaning business, but you know taking your foot off the gas, that we're almost done with rate hikes. At your meeting, when you were weighing up whether it was 25 or 50, did you discuss the merits of doing 25 today and 25 at the March meeting? Did you discuss whether two of the, you know, the same magnitude of rate hikes but spread over two meetings would have a greater influence on price setters. Did you discuss March in any way? Um, what should price setters expect for the remainder of the year? Thank you. Ziana? I have a, a similar question, Governor, from Fifi Peters at uh, CNBC Africa, MoneyWeb. A follow-up on the terminal rate. Market consensus believes today rate hike, today's rate hike marks the end of the current rate hiking cycle. Is the governor saying the market is running ahead of the sob, or are we at the end or near the end of the rate hiking cycle? Thank is that you. Is, That's that is the last question. Yes. No more questions in the room? Uh, Monique from Bloomberg. I wanted to know for your 3Q GDP forecast last year, what is it that your data wasn't picking up when the numbers came out from Stats is a, and have you redone your data to start picking up those changes going forward? Trinesha? Um, Governor, just uh, to Chris, you better prepare yourself for uh, Q3. <laughs> uh, they said it's to the research department. Uh, Governor, quick two questions, please. Is monetary policy now restrictive? Uh, given the higher inflation expectations, as well as all the risks to the inflation outlook, that you've highlighted today. How confident are you in getting inflation back to the target midpoint by the fourth quarter? Thank you. Chris, you wanna start? Uh, sure. Um, would you like me to deal with the unemployment? Q3, the Q3. Q3. Yeah. Um, look, um, I, I think the, the bottom line with the Q3 numbers is that the statistics just came out highly volatile. So we uh, run a now casting model. We have several now casting models actually, um, but there's always a lot of volatility in, that, in, in the outcomes. What we saw last year was that Q1 grew by 1.7% uh, quarter on quarter. So we had this very large first quarter increase. We had a small negative in the second quarter. 
And then there was just a rebound very strongly that came from very particular sectors in the economy, finance, agriculture, transport sector. So, um, you know, pretty hard to read what's going on, and that's why in the, in the statement we say that there's an unusually high level of volatility in the growth numbers. So some of what might have been happening is that economic agents reacted more strongly with growth or with expenditure uh, in the third quarter because they had put things off from the second quarter. If you remember in the second quarter of last year, running into the third quarter, there were a number of ne negative economic shocks to the economy, which might have, might have affected both sectoral outputs and expenditure decisions. Uh, and so we saw that very big increase. Uh, there's really no good way for us to account for it, uh, except to look back and try to understand what kind of errors we made in understanding those sectoral and expenditure uh, decisions and outcomes that we saw. Thanks. Uh, Rashad, can you deal with uh, the question of uh, uh, what growth level we need to create the jobs that we need? Thank you very much. Um, so, so uh, economists start off with what is the growth employment elasticity? How, how much of economic growth do you need to create how much of employment? Th those elasticities can change depending on what, what period you're talking about. But I think that you know, there's a rule of thumb we can get from, uh, from e economic history. And that is that you know, when we had the financial crisis, uh, or the years before the financial crisis, when the economy uh, was growing at about 5% a year. That was the first time we saw a sustained decrease uh, in, in the unemployment rate in this country. So for example, I think for the first time in post-apartheid South Africa, the unemployment rate went very low to towards the low 20%. We've never had an unemployment rate uh, uh, below that. So you know, the rule of thumb says, uh, given what we knew, is what, what we know about, about about the performance of the economy, once you start seeing five percent economic growth every year, uh, you start eroding into the unemployment rate, and unemployment comes down. Now those numbers could change, but uh, uh, the problem is that when we sit uh, at the current uh, numbers, uh, we see unemployment go up. Uh, when we are around two to three percent, we, we we're barely able to keep. Uh, the unemployment rate steady, but if you really want to, um, you know, make inroads into the unemployment rate, we really need to get to the four, five percent uh, uh, significantly. Now, you know, th those numbers may have changed slightly, but I'm, I'm using broad uh, uh, um, uh, kind of a, a rule of thumb about how you, how one should should think about it. Thank you. Thanks, Ra uh, Rashad. Um, that question about. Uh, uh, what the 25 basis points uh, uh, mean is more like taking your foot off the pedal. You know, you never win as a central banker. That's where we started in 2021. We started with 25 basis points, and the question was, what are you doing? You are taking a knife to a gunfight. Then we moved to 75 basis points. It's like, this is an overkill. You guys are going to kill this economy. Now we say that, okay, let us slow down and go to 25 basis points. You're saying that, oh, you are taking out your knife and there is still a gunfight taking place. Um, the, the point of the matter here is monetary policy acts with a lag. I'm not sure that, I don't think that we had, this economy had felt fully the increases that we had uh, so far uh, taken place. You must know that as we go into a meeting, even a decision not to change rates is still a decision. And so um, we have taken the steps that we have taken and we've decided that given where we are with the economy and where we are with the inflation rate and that we will be back within the target in the second quarter of this year, it might be time that we slow the pace of uh, the uh, increase. But we do state that the risks of the inflation outlook are on the upside. And because the risks of the inflation outlook are on, on the upside, doing nothing was not an option. And that is why on the table, there was both 25 basis points and 50 basis points. And this links back to Fifi's question which then says that are we reaching the end of the hiking cycle? Well, the point here is that, once again, 
we are not targeting the interest rates. So we can't talk about reaching the end of a hiking cycle. We are targeting inflation. If you want to know whether the hiking on interest rates is going to stop, as we have stated, you have got to see that inflation is not just declining, but that it is declining sustainably to the midpoint of our inflation targeting range. So we must be convinced that inflation is declining to 4.5% and that that happens in a sustainable manner. That is what you should worry uh, about. I know you talk to traders, and traders would be more interested in the terminal rate and so forth. It's not a very useful discussion. It's useful as a trader because you must trade on it. Uh, but for price setters, what matters is, has the inflation trajectory turned? And would the Reserve Bank remain resolved on dealing with uh, inflation. And I can say that from the questions that uh, had come through, it's very clear that we are resolved uh, uh, in, doing, uh, uh, in doing so. You had seen that, and uh, uh, your competitor there in the front uh, said that um, uh, the tone of the statement was such that you really meant business, and we thought that you were going to do more than what uh, you have done. As we go into the next meetings, because you said was there then a debate about whether we, you split 25-25, unfortunately that's not how we, uh, we make policy. We do not know what data will show between now and the next meeting. We will have to assess that data, take a view about the outlook of the economy, and then decide on an appropriate policy setting given the new data that uh, we would have received. As for the price status, look at our forecast and that we actually mean business about it. We will calibrate our policy such that we end up where we would like to be. And price formation, price setting, could, should be taking cognizance uh, of that. And of course, it is possible that price setters might not believe us. If price setters do not believe us, what happens? Inflation expectations go up. And if inflation expectations go up, meaning that price setters do not believe us, we have got to make ourselves believable. And the way to make ourselves believable is to recalibrate policy such that the inflation expectations go back to the uh, midpoint of the inflation uh, 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 targeting range. Prinesha? Uh, how confident are we that we will hit uh, uh, the target? Uh, well, we are. Uh, if we are not confident that we would hit the target, meaning that the inflation should be higher than that, uh, we would probably be adjusting policy a little bit more than what we had uh, uh, adjusted it. But this policy stance, which is also consistent with the, co uh, the quarterly projection model at the moment, is taking cognizance of the fact that after we are doing what we have done since 2021, we are now more confident that we will hit our uh, target. And of course, this is a dismal science that we play that is called economics. Things change, circumstances change, and we, as we said, there is a lot of uncertainty. And based on that, we have got to continue to be data dependent and recalibrate policy appropriately. Is monetary policy now in a restrictive uh, territory? No, we do not think so. We actually believe that the stance is still supportive of credit growth uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this economy. Uh, inflation, the most contem on a contemporaneous basis, the most recent inflation reading was 7.2. Uh, policy is just 7.25. So it's almost like in real terms, on a contemporaneous basis, um, policy rates are zero. If you take the policy rate and you minus uh, inflation, you are left with 0 0.3, so um, 0 0.03. So, so th th it's not, it's not 0 0.3, sorry. It's not going to be much. It's not going to be much. So, so that is reflective uh, of that. That is the first measure. The second measure, which is a little bit uh, complex, and I'm sure you talk to these chaps most of the time, that um, uh, we look at where neutral real rate is. A neutral real rate, 
in terms of this meeting and in terms of the focus, and we have got, we have got a sheet uh, that we have included with the MPC statement, is at 2.5 in real terms. Uh, on a contemporaneous uh, basis, as we have said, it's almost zero. And our average for this year for inflation, we project 5.4. If you look at a 5.4 and you look at the uh, policy rate, you will say that, oh, that's about 2. Uh, something and that uh, they are closer to neutral. Uh, well, uh, what is matters here is that we are still below neutral, which says that the stance is, uh, uh, is, still, uh, uh, is still supportive. Um, uh, whatever neutral is, it is uh, an unobservable variable, it is an estimate, and anyone could look at this and then say where the policy rate is relative to neutral, it is still, uh, it is still uh, uh, um, uh, accommodative. Um, yes, that deals with all the economics. Let's go back to the um, SABC. Uh, the question is, uh, the statement that the president made and what changes or amendments uh, uh, to the constitution that would have uh, to be made, I think that question is best directed at the president and not us, uh, because you see, we are uh, implementers of the constitution, we are implementers of legislation. We are not the legislators. If the people of this country decide that the constitution must be changed to um, have a different mandate to the Reserve Bank than the one that is uh, in the constitution, well, I guess that is what the people of this country would, for, would have decided and we would just follow. The fact that we decided to target price stability was not because we just woke up one day and decided we are going to target price stability. It is because the people of this country decided that when the constitution was written, the constitution must comply with a certain number of constitutional principles and with them from those constitutional principles on which the constitution was based, there was a principle that said there must be an independent institution tasked with the responsibility to protect the value of the currency and that such institution must act independently and without fear, favor, or prejudice. The Constitution then went on, as it was written, to declare that the South African Reserve Bank shall be the central bank of the Republic of South Africa. And that the primary object of the South African Reserve Bank shall be the protection of the value of the currency in the interest of balanced and sustainable growth. Now, You say that they talk about the Reserve Bank's mandate to being able to bolster growth and bolster employment. If you have been listening, or you, you can subsequently also go and read this statement and see how many times growth and employment feature uh, in this statement, you can back, go back to our previous statements. You will find that growth and employment feature uh, in our statements. We are not pursuing price stability for the sake of it. The constitution, the authors of our constitution, weren't they students of history? They understood that you cannot have balance and sustainable growth in an environment of price instability. And that price stability is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for balance and sustainable growth. And if we live through to our mandate, and we have to pursue price stability. We would not be able to do that unless we take cognizance of developments in both the labor market and in the real economy. Because those developments in the labor market and in the real economy have an impact on the price stability outcomes. And so we have got to take cognizance of that. And we do. Four. Balance and sustainable growth cannot be when inflation is running amok and eating the incomes of South Africans. 
high inflation is not a growth strategy. So if, if anyone thinks that by saying that you must also target employment and growth and so forth, then maybe you could have a little bit of inflation and you could have higher growth and higher in, uh, employment, disabuse them of it. High inflation is not a growth strategy. High inflation is not an employment strategy. But in pursuing our mandate of price stability, we take cognizance of the development in both the labor market and in the real economy in terms of what is happening to economic growth and economic uh, activity. And you know, uh, Fed this and the central banks uh, uh, do these things and the most common example used has always been like, oh, the Fed is also pursuing, um, they are pursuing price stability, but they also have got an employment mandate. And, and I, it just baffles me how little people read. If you go and read the Fed's act, it actually says that they must pursue low inflation, maximum employment, and guess what? Low long-term interest rates. You can never have low long-term interest rates if you have high inflation. To have low long-term interest rates, inflation has got to be lower. And that is the essence of it. But get something clear. If you listen to the Fed and you look at what they are saying, they are talking of 2% being their price stability objective. Did they put a number for employment? No, they don't put a number for employment. And that is because they believe that the inflation target that they have is consistent with maximum employment. And underline that, maximum, it doesn't say full. Because the maximum employment depends on the state of the economy at a particular point in time, the balance in the economy. And that is why the authors of our economy said, you, our constituents, you do this in the interest of balanced and sustainable growth uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the republic. And um, yes, and of course, another example recently mentioned had been uh, New Zealand because they too, and at, at three years ago, they included uh, employment as part of their thing. Well, they have just announced now that they are revisiting that because uh, the central bank is not able uh, to meet that. Do we want to go back and rediscover these things? That is not a decision of the central bank. It's a decision of the people of this country through their publicly elected officials. And if they decide to change the constitution, says that is what must be done, well, the central bank will just implement to the best of its ability what uh, is done. What is clear, though, is that when you give any institution responsibility, you must also give it the tools to do it. So when you say you are going to give us the responsibility for price stability, you've got to give us the tools for, for, for price stability. And so we have been given uh, instruments in the prudential space that we would use for financial stability. We have been given a say on how the financial markets in this country operate because we have got a responsibility for financial stability. And when financial markets are not functioning, the central bank steps in to make sure financial markets function because we have got a, price, a, a financial stability mandate. When you give us a, an employment mandate, you'll also have to give us tools to create employment. What those tools are, I do not know. You are going to have to give us a say on how labor markets function, because otherwise you will be setting us to fail. Are central banks designed to shape the way labor markets should be? I do not think so. But if the people of this country decide that is what uh, they want, it can be done. It's not like these experiments have not been tried uh, elsewhere. And uh, people talk about we need to um, implement uh, unorthodox policies to uh, do uh, certain things. Well, let me sum up for you. Unorthodox policies have led to exactly orthodox outcomes. High inflation is not a growth strategy. That concludes the business of today. I thank you very much for your attendance. We will see you in March.